Hello YouTube. In this video and the next, I'm going to take a look at Max Stirner. Now, before I get into the material here, I need to state an important caveat. I'm focusing on the aspects of Stirner's work that are of most interest to me, uh, but there's a lot of important material in The Ego and His Own, material that's actually rather central to Stirner's argument that I'm not really going to be covering. So, um, you should take this more as an introduction to what I find interesting within Stirner rather than as an introduction to Stirner in general. Um, and also bear in mind I'm, I'm talking about a translated work that was rather open to interpretation even in its original language, so uh, there may be reasonable disagreement about whether Stirner really held all of the views I'm attributing to him. Um, okay then, with that said, Stirner is best known for proposing a kind of egoism, and that's where we will begin. In standard discussions of egoism, two broad types of egoism are usually presented. There is descriptive or psychological egoism, and there is normative or ethical egoism. According to psychological egoism, all people are in fact motivated only by self-interest. Even actions that seem on the surface, as it were, to be altruistic have purely self-interested motives. Psychological egoists will say that when somebody behaves in a way that is seemingly self-sacrificing, such as giving money to charity, they actually do it to gain some benefit from it. Um, giving money to charity, you know, Im improves my social status somehow, makes me look good to others, or maybe it just makes me feel good, and that's why I'm doing it. Ethical egoism, by contrast, is the view that each person ought to do only what is in their self-interest. You ought to act only for yourself. You ought to promote only your own good. So ethical egoism says we ought to be psychological egoists. Um, I have a couple of videos on ethical egoism that you may wish to check out. So, with this said, we have an immediate problem, because Stirner's egoism doesn't really fit into either of these categories. At least as I read him, Stirner does not suppose that people are motivated only by self-interest. He accepts that people can have the promotion of the interests of others as a fundamental desire. At the same time, he isn't really an ethical egoist, well, certainly isn't an ethical egoist in the traditional sense. Um, as we'll see later, he does not endorse any particular moral obligations. He would not claim that anybody has a moral duty to maximise their own self-interest. Now, I think that the way to look at what Stirner is doing, um, and this is maybe a controversial way to look at it, but I think the best way to look at it is that he's presenting a particular way of life the egoist way of life, which he views as exhibiting a kind of excellence of character. Um, he's not interested in prescribing how other people ought to act, but he does regard uh, egoism as, as superior. Not, not exactly morally superior, but other ways of life, other ways of thinking about the world are based on what he sees as uh, mistaken presuppositions. I think that's the way I would look at uh, Stirner's general take on this. So, um, yeah, it's not exactly either psychological egoism or ethical egoism, um, but it is a kind of egoism. Now, egoism is often defined as selfishness, as the exclusive pursuit of one's own desires. Stirner's egoism is a little more subtle than this. Uh, the key uh, aspect of Stirner's egoism is what he calls ownness. It's difficult to give a precise definition of ownness, but it's essentially a matter of self-mastery, self-rule, self-determination, authenticity, individual autonomy. As Stirner puts it, he says, I am my own only when I am master of myself instead of being mastered by anything else. So the egoist acts only for her own sake. She is concerned only for her own interest, and she sees all things in the world, including other people, as tools that she can take for her own use. She refuses to be subjugated to the will of others, and she serves no higher cause. Um, some useful examples of self-mastery are presented in the, uh, Stirner's preface. Stirner names God as the paradigmatic egoist. God, at least as he is standardly conceived, is a being that serves no higher person and no higher cause. God is the creator of everything, claims everything as his property, and has authority over everything. All other beings and all other causes are subordinated to God. Um, indeed, all of these things emanate from God. So God has no cause that is alien to him, no cause, no concern outside himself. Um, now, of course, God 
is concerned with many things, uh, truth, love, morality, justice, and so on. But this is because on the standard view, again, uh, God himself is truth, love, morality, justice. These things emanate from God and therefore belong to God as his own. So God is his own master. Or consider, for example, nationalism. Uh, Stunner says, a nation serves itself and expects its citizens to serve its cause. It, it serves itself and it uses its citizens as its property. Um, the nation will valorise those who fall in battle because they have served its cause. Um, like God, the nation uh, demands the submission and allegiance of the individuals that it rules over. So, what these examples illustrate is that you are your own master. You are an egoist when you recognise nothing as an authority over you and you are concerned with nothing but yourself. You look upon the world and all the things in it simply as your property to do with as you will. You claim the world as your own. All things are treated as a means to your end. The egoist recognises no constraints of duty or obligation. There are no rules to which she would be willing to conform without benefit to herself. And, and this is, of course, why we should not take Stoner's egoism as a straightforward moral claim, like standard ethical egoism. If egoism were to amount to the claim that you ought to maximise your own self-interest, then it would just be another moral rule, right? But those who affirm their ownness simply act for themselves, not for any moral rule. Now, this uh, rather obviously has some, some quite radical consequences, and it, it may be worth emphasising just how radical Stirner's view of ownness is. Many of the institutions and activities of everyday life will turn out to be incompatible with ownness. Take, for instance, making promises. When I make a promise sincerely, I place myself under an obligation to others. So if you lend me some money and I promise to pay it back within a week, I have obligated myself to pay it back within a week. Uh, of course, circumstances might arise that remove the obligation, say if I'm injured or something, you know, I have a car accident, or maybe someone in my family is in injured, or I, I suddenly lose all my money somehow, I'm burgled, whatever. But assuming normal circumstances, we take it that, that this obligation holds, hold. I take myself to be obligated to return your money to you. Um, I, take, I take myself to have your property, and since it's your property, I have to give it back. Now, it might be supposed that there's nothing here that's incompatible with autonomy or self-mastery. Uh, after all, I can choose whether or not to make the promise. If I'm entering into a contract voluntarily, well, my autonomy is preserved, surely, right? Like, I mean, you, you know, I've, I've chosen the obligation. You know, whenever I, whenever I enter into any kind of contract, it's something that I have chosen to do. So that doesn't violate my autonomy, right? Well... Stirner rejects this. For Stirner, to accept any binding obligation, to view any rule whatsoever as a constraint on one's behaviour, is to allow oneself to be mastered by another person, even if that other person is your past self. The egoist recognises no rules, not even rules imposed upon herself. Uh, according to Stirner, to be bound by your own rules, or to uh, accept an obligation based on your past choices, would be to allow a particular expression of your will to become your eternal commander. Why should I care now if I made a promise in the past? The fact that I was a fool yesterday does not mean that I must be a fool today. Um, now, of course, the egoist may well promise to do things, and she may keep her promises. She might have good reasons for doing this, but she will only do this when she judges that it's in her best interest. Um, she does not treat uh, the act of promising as generating any genuine obligation. So I, I guess the way to put it would be that an egoist can't make a sincere promise. Uh, if she promises to do something, she's kind of engaging in a deception. Um, she can't sincerely promise uh, because a sincere promise would be to place herself under an obligation and egoists recognise no obligations. <clears throat> okay, we've seen that onus is a matter of self-mastery, autonomy. This is uh, and, you know, part of this is a rejection of external authority. But it's also important to emphasise that self-mastery can be threatened by your own desires also. For this reason, Stoner is quite critical of what he calls egoists in the usual sense. Egoists in the usual sense, uh, ordinary egoists, are, Stoner says, 
Selfish people, looking out for their advantage, sober, calculating, basically selfishness. Um, and he gives as, as examples the, the avaricious man who is interested only in gathering wealth and in material treasures, and uh, the lover who disregards all other things and endures all manner of dangers in sole pursuit of affairs with women. The trouble with ordinary egoism is that as Sterner sees it, it's also self-sacrificing. People may sacrifice their autonomy for uh, petty reasons in addition to idealistic reasons. So the political activist who allows herself to be martyred for a cause, that's self-sacrifice with an idealistic motivation. Maybe she's motivated by love of her fellow man, if she's a socialist, say, or maybe she's motivated by love of God, if she's a Christian theocrat or, or whatever. I, either way, you know, th this is an, an idealistic concern. She's, she's concerned with the world, with other things, with other people. That's an idealistic motivation. Now, if you consider the man who is concerned only with material gain, with acquiring a large house, a fast car, lots of material possessions to show off. Well, the problem is that this man has subjugated himself to his appetites. He's subjugated himself to what would be considered a you know, petty motivation. So as Stirner puts it, an avaricious man is not self-owned, but a servant, and he can do nothing for his own sake without at the same time doing it for his Lord's sake precisely like the godly man. The avaricious man is a slave to his appetite for wealth. He belongs to his appetites. And he ends up sacrificing his other interests, his personality. He sacrifices himself in pursuit of this singular goal. And it's just the same as how a political activist is a slave to her political cause or a slave to God. Um, either way, the, the, this person is in a position, is in a condition of what Sterner calls possessedness. The person is possessed by an external force instead of being a self-owner. Um, the, the singular pursuit of wealth could not be the whole of one's ownness. So the ordinary egoist simply acts on the basis of whatever her strongest inclinations are, plus her capacities for pursuing those inclinations. The Sternerite egoist has, in addition, a kind of control over her own desires, so that she's not enslaved to any of those desires. Um, you know, she, she has mastery over her desires, she does not allow herself to be mastered by them. So egoism for Stirner isn't simply selfishness in the traditional sense, uh, and it, it's important to distinguish it from that. Now, of course, having said all this, it's also important to emphasize that the, the Sternerite egoist is not aspiring to achieve some higher moral ideal. What's wrong with selfish avarice, according to Stirner, is not that it violates the demands of morality or that it violates the commands of God or anything like that. It's, the problem is simply that the individual has become possessed by, uh, by one of their desires. Um, you know, so one way to put all this is that the Sternerite egoist resists subjugation uh, both to the forces that are perceived as external, such as society, the state, God, morality, and also to forces that are perceived as internal, one's thoughts and desires. The egoist will, of course, have desires, ideas, emotions, concerns, projects. She will not allow those projects to dominate her. She will have a degree of detachment from them. Essentially, she views all of these things um, not as... Uh, kind of constraints that rule her behaviour, but as her own property to do with as she wishes. So just as you look upon the world as your property, you take the same attitude to your thoughts and feelings. So that, briefly stated, is Stirner's egoism, at least as I understand it. The Stirnerite egoist exhibits an extreme uh, individual autonomy, and this is expressed in the idea of ownness. Now, one of the key points about ownness is that it is fundamentally an active choice. You can choose to embrace ownness or you can choose to subjugate yourself. Indeed, ultimately, it's always the individual who subjugates themselves. Nobody can deprive me of self-mastery, of ownness. I can only do this to myself. And one of the primary ways that this occurs is through a kind of uh, reification or projection of abstractions. In this process, uh, concepts that arise from our thinking, from our creative endeavours, from our social interactions and so on, are assigned an existence independent of us and are treated as external powers to which individuals must be subordinated. God is, of course, a classic example of this. Um, 
because there is no God. But people act as if this entity exists and as if it has authority over them. Uh, it's also fairly obvious how this applies to something like morality, right? People come up with moral rules and then project them into the external world and treat them as, uh, as, as these external powers to which we must conform. So we have concepts created by us that are projected into the world and treated as external authorities. Um, so as I say, God and morality are kind of obvious cases of this, but Sterner sees reification occurring everywhere. Take, for instance, mankind. Um, now, of course, mankind exists, right? But mankind really is just a collection of individuals. What happens is that people start to think of mankind as a whole, as this, as this sort of independent abstract entity with an essence of its own over and above individual men. So in the first step of reification, we distinguish the essence of things from the appearances of things. Essences lie behind the appearances. Uh, the essence of a thing is you know, what is necessary and sufficient for being that thing. Certain properties are posited as being essential to man. Maybe rationality, maybe love, maybe morality, maybe the desire for knowledge, or whatever. Aristotle held that man is a rational animal. That's the essential property of man. For Descartes, the essence of man is the thinking mind, cognition. Um, now, of course, everybody recognises that as men, we have other properties. Uh, so yes, I, I have a body, for instance. That's one of my that's one of my properties. But the body is seen as merely an accidental property, as merely an appearance. It doesn't define what I essentially am. So the first step of reification involves kind of valorizing certain properties of individual men and then dismissing other properties, right? You know, you pick out certain properties as being the essential properties. And that gives you the concept of the ideal man, um, man as a whole, and all individual men instantiate this. So next, the individual is treated as irrelevant, except insofar as she exemplifies and serves the, uh, the ideal or abstraction. Since I am a man and I share essential properties with other men, I have duties to man as a whole. The essence of man is exalted and placed above individual men. Man, man, the essence of man is treated it's, so man is treated not merely as a collection of individuals with all kinds of different properties, but as an ideal or norm that all individuals must serve and live up to. I'm a man, you're a man, but man in the abstract is, in this sense, separate from any particular individual. A nice illustration of this point is provided by Stoner's discussion of the disagreement between a Jew and a Christian. The Jew and the Christian, he says, halfway exclude each other. They exclude each other insofar as they serve different masters. The Jew enslaves himself to Jehovah. Um, actually, I, is it? I, I don't know. I don't know what Jews call their God. But the Jew enslaves himself to the Jewish God. The Christian enslaves himself to the Christian God. Both see themselves as men. And as men, they recognise each other and they take themselves not to be unique individuals, but to share in the essential properties of men. And so as men, they have duties to one another. Uh, being a man is a kind of role with corresponding obligations. If I see man, the abstraction in you, and I similarly see man, the abstraction in myself, the same abstraction in both of us, then I will care for you as I would care for myself. So by reifying man, the individual becomes a servant of man, just as the Christian is a servant of the Christian God, or the Jew is a servant of the Jewish God. Um, indeed, Stoner is quite explicit that he sees man as a kind of secular god. Um, he says, the human religion is only the last metamorphosis of the Christian religion, uh, for liberalism is a religion because it separates my essence from me and sets it above me, because it exalts man to the same extent as any other religion does its god or idol. Uh, later he says, man is the god of today, and fear of man has taken place of the old fear of god. Man is treated then as, a, as another supreme being to which individuals are subjugated. So in reification, the individual has some concept, God, man, society, humanity, morality, property, whatever. These are abstract concepts. Men exist, but I have created the concept man by focusing on particular properties of men and treating them as essential. 
So we have this abstract concept. This concept is then seen not as something created by the individual, but as an external power to which the individual is subordinate. I'm, I'm subordinate because, of course, I too am a man. So, you know, I'm, I'm subordinate to this abstract ideal of man. So I cease to treat my thoughts, my ideas, my values as my property, as my creations, but instead I treat them as my master. Reification makes what is mine into something alien to me. Um, and this process is, of course, encouraged throughout a person's life by a variety of social institutions. Um, it's often in the interests of authorities for individuals to subjugate themselves in this way. Uh, but it's important to see that this is this is ultimately something that I'm doing, right? Um, it's not like other people can can do this to me. Ultimately, it's it's this is on me, as it were. Um, I'm subjugating myself. Uh, it's worth noting if you've read anything about Sterner, you've probably heard the term spook. Uh, he criticises a number of things as spooks. A spook is an idea or abstraction which is reified, treated as though it were an external power and used to control the individual's behaviour. So spook in discussions of Sterner refers to this uh, process of reification. How then do we resist reification? Well, the egoist, according to Sterner, takes herself to have no fixed identity. The egoist is always becoming, always transforming, always reinventing herself as the need arises. In this sense, the egoist is literally nothing. She has no essential properties. As Sterner says, I am the creative nothing, the nothing out of which I, as creator, create everything. The egoist recognises she has no essential properties, no fixed identity. Instead, she constitutes herself through her own activities, by taking things in the world, including her own body and her mind, as her own, uh, manipulating them, acting on them, but always treating them only as her belongings, not as determining her identity. Um, now, of course, you, you, know, you can't do just anything you want, right? Sterner is not saying that people can, can like, just to do anything. Um, the world imposes various obstacles and constraints upon us. Some of those obstacles may be shared with other people, but there are always various ways to respond to any given obstacle. Um, so the obstacle can't be taken as determining your identity for you. Um, so I am a man, but this is only one of my qualities. It's only an attribute of me. Uh, I'm similarly an animal, an Englishman, a philosopher, and so on. But we can't take any of my behaviours or attributes as determining my identity. Indeed, any attempt to describe my identity will fail because I'm unique and always open to change. Uh, right now, in the process of writing this video, I'm engaging in reason. Uh, rationality is, currently at least, one of my attributes. Aristotle took that to be an essential attribute. Man is a rational animal. But I need not always be rational. Reason is something that we do. It's a creation of our thinking. So there's only your reason and my reason, not human reason in the abstract. In supposing that there are laws of reason or whatever, and that it's the essential property of men that they conform to these laws, we are projecting our creation into the external world and treating it as an authority over us. Um, so th for, the, for the egoist, yes, I have many properties but none of these properties determine who I essentially am. Uh, recall Stirner's example of the Jew and the Christian. They exclude each other halfway, he says. They, ser they serve different masters in their religions, but they serve the same master insofar as they take themselves to be both essentially men. Egoists, by contrast, exclude each other wholly. They do not share anything. Um, they are both men only insofar as they both take manhood as their own. Uh, they assert ownership over this attribute. In themselves, they are each unique and undefinable, and each of them may respond to manhood and use their manhood in very different ways. So that's not an essential property of them. It's merely an attribute. Um, okay, so, so this is reification. As I say, this is one of the central ways in which individuals subjugate themselves. Throughout his book, Stirner applies this framework in a critique of many uh, of the foundational concepts of modern society. 
humanism, morality, reason, all of these are, um, are reifications. One of the most powerful critiques, I think, is devoted to uh, freedom. And it's during this discussion, uh, Stirner usefully contrasts freedom with ownness. So um, I think that, that this will give us uh, not only a, an interesting critique of the concept of freedom, but it will also help to explain exactly what ownness is supposed to be. Um, so anyway, it's quite natural to think of egoism and anarchism and similar views as promoting individual freedom, right? Like a lot of anarchists will frame their positions in terms of freedom for the individual. But Stirner rejects this. Ownness is explicitly not a matter of freedom. Uh, freedom is just another abstraction that has been reified and used uh, to subjugate individuals. So one problem with freedom is that it is viewed as tied to particular institutional arrangements. Freedom is achieved only when the state is set up in such and such a way, um, where, where people will have very different ideas about how it needs to be set up in order to achieve freedom. Nobody ever actually desires freedom, generally speaking. Rather, there is always some particular kind of freedom that a person or movement might support. And this freedom will bring with it a new type of domination. By providing freedom in certain aspects of our lives, we inevitably lose freedom in other ways. Thus, the liberal, for example, wants to be free from the arbitrary hierarchies of aristocracy and wants to be free to use their property as they see fit. But in achieving this, she must impose a system of property rights. So you will not be free to, for example, take an apple from the orchard owned by another man. So you have achieved freedom in a certain respect and lost freedom in another respect. The socialist wants to be free from inequalities produced by liberal property rights and so imposes collectivism, um, which again will reduce your freedom over your own things. Uh, we'll discuss these points in much more detail in the next video, but for now the important thing to note is that people always aim for freedom in some particular respect. There's always some particular kind of freedom that people want. And, and when then what happens is that the, the particular kind of freedom, the particular conception of freedom is essentialized and is treated as defining freedom in general, uh, you know, despite the existence of numerous uh, political movements, all with different ideas here. So in pursuit of freedom, people will reject particular constraints on their behavior, only to set up different constraints that are imposed upon all. Um, again, the individual is subjugated to an abstraction, to a particular ideal of freedom. All social arrangements provide some freedoms while removing others. Uh, this need not be particularly troubling. My liberties are limited by all kinds of powers, not just human powers. Uh, the natural world also deprives me of freedoms in many ways. Freedom is always diminished in one way or another. Freedom in general is not something that could ever be granted to you, even in principle, uh, because the ability to do anything requires uh, some limits on one's freedom. In order for me to act in the world, there must be things in the world that I take as my own and can use as tools. But these things will impose constraints upon me. Um, you know, that, 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 that these things will impose, like by existing in any kind of environment, you're going to have limits on you. Uh, absolute freedom, freedom from all external interference, freedom from all external constraints, that would be annihilation. So freedom, like absolute freedom, is, uh, as Stirner says, empty of substance, and it would clearly be absurd to have that as a goal. So freedom is, is a phantom. Um, we should not ask whether we want freedom. The question must be freedom from what? Freedom from others interfering with your property, as the liberal supposes, or freedom from want, freedom from poverty, as the socialist supposes, or something else. Um, the term freedom can be used sensibly to pick out any of these goals. Each of these will kind of create new constraints on behavior, but by viewing this, by viewing any of these as achieving freedom in general, the new forms of domination are ignored. So I accept that freedom is, is always diminished in one way or another. I accept that social interaction will impose limits to my freedom, and I put up with these limits when it's to my benefit. Um, this is just an inevitable result of interacting with other people and groups um, and things in the world that may be stronger than me. Um, Ownness, by contrast, 
need not ever be diminished. I need not accept any limit to my ownness. I need not treat anything as an authority over myself. Another person might get in my way, just as a rock might get in my way, but the other person need not be taken as an authority, just as I do not treat the rock as an authority. I look upon the person and the rock as tools or obstacles, nothing more. Neither has my submission or my loyalty. All ideals of freedom make freedom dependent on one's external circumstances. Stoner notes that the paradigmatic example of the unfree person is the slave, somebody who is literally the legal property of another. If I'm enslaved, I will lack many freedoms. But Stoner says I need not lack ownness. When the master hits me, I still take it that it is my bones that moan. My body is not free from torment, but it is my body. Nothing anyone can do can change this. I mean, the master may have a legal right over my body, but I still have autonomy over it. It's, it's ultimately still mine that I use. Um, suppose the master were to literally cut off my leg and take it away from me. Well, what he's taken in that case is not really my leg, but rather the corpse of a leg, right? Like, like once, once that leg has been cut off, um, I, I no longer have that sense of autonomy over it. Uh, so he's, he's not, he doesn't, he doesn't have mine. He doesn't have my leg. He just has a leg. Uh, so it's this sense of autonomy, this sense of self-possession that ultimately grounds liberation. Ownness is the limit of other people's power and it's where the resistance to their power begins. So the state of freedom is passive in the sense that it's just a matter of, uh, a lack of constraints imposed by external circumstances. Whereas ownness is active, it involves an assertion of one's autonomy and a struggle against unwanted constraints. As Stirner puts it, I am free from what I am rid of, owner of what I have in my power or what I control. My own I am at all times and under all circumstances if I know how to have myself and do not throw myself away on others. Stoner is critical then of aiming for that which you desire to be conferred by some powerful other. Suppose we petition for freedom of speech. What exactly is meant by this? Well, we want the state to confer upon us a legal right to express a certain range of things. But even if we get the freedom we desire, this presupposes that the state is the legitimate arbiter of what I may or may not express. The legal right to freedom of speech granted by the state is a mere permission granted by the state. Uh, the relationship of master to subject, the, auton the authority of the state over the individual remains the same. And of course, the, you know, the permission that is granted may be withdrawn at any time at the whim of the state. Um, as in fact, you know, many countries that have affirmed freedom of speech have later revoked it in various ways. Since freedom is something dependent on the activities of others, or it's, you know, it's a permission granted by others, it must be provided by those others, so it's alienated from the individual. To aim for a condition of freedom, therefore involves subjugating yourself to the will of those others. It's dependent on what those others do, whereas ownness is is not, right? Ownness is an assertion of your power, um, of your capacity. Now, having said all this, Stirner does recognise that there is something important and significant in all of the talk about freedom, right? Like the desire for freedom is um, is, is, is something is, is important. Um, but he suggests that really the desire for freedom comes from, from our desire to remove constraints. We want to control ourselves and the world around us. And why do we want this? Well, Stoner says that what we really want here is not the freedom to do X or to have X, such as the freedom to drink wine. What we really want is X itself. Um, X is something I can acquire and enjoy, that I can take as my property, right? So the freedom to drink wine, right? What I really want is drink to drink wine, right? The, the wine is something that I can actually have as my own. Freedom is worthless to me if it does not bring me the things that I want. And conversely, if I have the things that I want, it really doesn't matter to me whether I'm free to have them, right? Um, the, the freedom 
to have X or to do X is a mere useless permission granted to me by a foreign entity. What matters in practice is how I use the freedoms that I'm granted or how I act against the constraints that are imposed. And that depends on me. It depends on my ownness. Those who affirm their ownness, who are concerned only with themselves, will simply take the things that they want, at least when they're able to do so. Um, they're, they're not going to be concerned about whether, the, whether or not they're free to do so. Uh, they make the world into their property. They make the world into a tool for them to use to their own ends. Ownness is not dependent on one's circumstances. Ownness is not a matter of a lack of constraint. It's not a permission to do something that might be bequeathed to us by the state or by anybody else. Ownness is an expression of my power. I can assert myself and assert my possession of things regardless of external constraints. Uh, ownness is not an indeterminate ideal or abstraction like freedom is, but it's an active act of possession of thoughts, objects, values as my own and a refusal to recognise any authority over me. Now it's important to note that Stirner is not arguing that we should replace one goal with another. He's not arguing that we should replace the goal of freedom with the goal of ownness. Uh, ownness is more uh, descriptive than normative. I, you know, I am my own when I recognise nothing as an authority over me, when I take myself and the world as being mine. Um, and then the, the, the point is that like, yes, freedom matters, but the, requ the required kinds of freedom are just determined by the individual. So if some kind of constraint is not inconvenient to me, then I will not want to be rid of it. And I may even take some pleasure in it, as when I give up some freedoms in order to have fulfilling relationships with others. Uh, you gladly let freedom go when unfreedom suits you, as Stirner says. And only I can decide what kinds of freedom matter to me, uh, not the state not political movements such as liberalism or socialism. So my, you know, the, I guess one way to think of it is that my freedoms you know, flow from my ownness. Okay, well, uh, let's summarise then. Uh, there are three important features of, of ownness, uh, as, as I see it at least, that comprise Stirner's egoism. First, ownness is of absolute value. The egoist does not accept any trade-off between ownness and, and other things. Um, she does not accept any sacrifice of individual autonomy. Second, ownness is totally incompatible with subjugation to the will of others. Um, now this is, this is an important point um, because on many accounts of autonomy, an autonomous person can subjugate themselves legitimately such as by making a promise or consenting to a particular government. Uh, consider, for instance, the you know, social contract theories of the state, where the legitimacy of the state re rests on the consent of the governed. Um, we can legitimately impose binding constraints on ourselves without violating autonomy. Um, it's just as long as we, you know, as long as we consent, as long as we do it voluntarily. Stirner's egoism rejects all subjugation, even self-imposed. There are no binding obligations, period. Um, third, no other person can grant you ownness, and no other person can deprive you of ownness. You must make the active choice either to affirm your ownness or to subjugate yourself. So I guess before you know ending, it might be worth comparing Stirner's egoism to the egoism of someone like Ayn Rand. In Randian egoism, the individual is subjugated to certain moral and rational constraints. Rand affirms objective morality, libertarian property rights, objective reason. Rand thinks, for example, that we can learn by the application of reason that it would be immoral for me to steal your property should I desire it, because this would be to force you to sacrifice yourself for my benefit. Um, Rand expects individuals to be subordinated to her ideal, to act in accordance with morality and reason as she conceives of them. Uh, from Stirner's perspective, Rand should probably be seen more as an anti-altruist than an egoist. Um, the, the, the moral individual, on Rand's view, doesn't sacrifice himself for others, nor sacrifices others for himself. But Stirner would no doubt object at this point. The individual is being sacrificed to a variety of reified concepts of reason, morality, property rights. 
And this really amounts to an indirect sacrifice to others, insofar as these concepts are, of course, merely human creations. Um, Rand may well take selfishness in the standard sense to be a virtue, but she certainly doesn't take ownness to be a virtue. Um, so when we attribute egoism to Stirner, it's important to see that this is quite different from uh, egoism as it is standardly conceived and egoism as it has been conceived in um, other parts of uh, uh, other areas of the literature. Um, okay, I'm going to end this video here. I'll shortly be uploading a second video in which we will connect all of this more explicitly to political philosophy and examine Stirner's status as an anarchist. Um, but that is all for now. Thanks for watching.